Good morning, everyone. My name is Winnie Branton. I am here today as the moderator of the Land Banks 101 session. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about land bank basics, and then we're going to be uh, we're going to be hearing from two Pennsylvania land bank leaders, Joe Chack from the Northeast Pennsylvania Land Bank and Christy Mahaney from the Erie County Land Bank. We're going to share uh, some insights and hear from them about their work getting their land bank started and up and running. But first, I'm going to offer you some uh, information and background about the Pennsylvania Land Bank Law and set the stage for the stories that Christy and Joe will tell. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so Land Banks 101 is our session. This is me, just a little background about me. I've worked um, for years now with the Housing Alliance as a consultant and trainer on land banks in Pennsylvania. And I have learned so much from those land bank leaders who are out there doing the job every day. And I look forward to hearing uh, Christy and Joe's story today with you. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to start off with some land bank basics, and then we're going to dive into some insights and lessons learned from Joe and Christy. And uh, just a little bit about Joe and Christy. Joe um, was there at the beginning, um, a land bank pioneer in Pennsylvania, when um, the law was being passed and then advocating for its passage and then helping um, his own land bank gets started, but then working to help others get started with land banks too. Christy is in Erie County and she's in a unique position, which I'm sure she'll share with us. Lots of stakeholders, an Erie City Land Bank as a partner and other municipalities who are now joining and adding on to uh, the members that she is working with up in Erie County. So on to a little bit about land bank basics. A land bank is a, a governmental entity and its sole purpose is to convert vacant, abandoned and tax delinquent properties to productive use. The Pennsylvania land bank law, which was passed in 2012, it authorizes the formation of land banks and then it sets some rules for operating and governance. Um, they take many forms and touch communities of all kinds in Pennsylvania. The law is flexible and optional. Um, in terms of options, um, there are two for creating a land bank. One is you create a standalone land bank, which includes uh, eligible counties, municipalities, and then multi-municipal jurisdictions. And then the second option, which was recently enacted, allows land bank jurisdictions to designate their redevelopment authorities to act as land banks. Why land banks? Here are just some of the reasons that communities have uh, based their decision on and which are also reasons for some of the uh, land banks across the nation uh, for, for setting up land banks and using this tool. It's a proven tool. It removes barriers to getting problem properties back onto the tax rolls. It allows for a uniform process for doing that. And then it can also serve as that central hub for blight prevention because much of this work is dispersed among multiple government agencies. In Pennsylvania, there are 25, now 27, um, established land banks in different states of operation. And as you can see from the map, they are uh, dispersed across the Commonwealth and in different stages of operation. And many of these land banks um, have uh, been involved with uh, the newly formed uh, land bank network, which uh, the Housing Alliance is organizing and leading the effort to get that up and running this year. So just a couple of slides on how does a land bank work. Um, land banks are uh, mechanisms to allow for the transfer of uh, vacant, abandoned, and blighted properties to new owners. The key tool that a land bank has is its ability to uh, acquire properties at judicial tax sales without having to bid against 
other bidders and be the highest bidder. The law sets forth a process by which the land bank can negotiate with the tax, the tax claim bureau or other taxing authority in order to acquire that property through a negotiated agreement. Many land banks are using that provision under the law in order to acquire properties and transfer them to uh, new owners. And again, highlighting that this is a locally driven strategy. So it's very important that we have um, our uh, facilities and land banks ready and operating for uh, the future. So how does a land bank work? Here's side lot dispositions. Here we wanna focus on what comes after the blight. That is, what do we do with these blighted properties or what do we ask the new owner to do with blighted properties when they go back um, into the hands of that new owner? Side lot dispositions, brownfields redevelopment, community spaces and green infrastructure. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the program over to Christy Mahaney from the Erie County Land Bank and I'm going to stop my share. And as I do that, Christy's going to come on and uh, she will share her story. Hi, good morning. All right, let me share my screen. All right. All right, um, this is me. I'm Christy Mahaney. I'm the executive director of the Erie County Land Bank here in Erie, Pennsylvania. We are one of two land banks um, in the area. There's one within the city and then there is us within the county. Um, I come from a background of, I spent about 15 years in the real estate industry. I was a real estate agent for a long period of time dealing with different investors, dealing with you know private homeowners. Um, so I come at it from this, this filter of the real estate side of things. And realistically, we as a land bank are like the worst investors ever. We, we get these properties that nobody else knows what to do with. And we basically um, invest either a lot of money or some amount of money into them and, and try to get them back to some sort of productive use. Um, so that's a little bit about me. There's three basic topics that I was gonna try to cover today. I know we are, um, semi-limited on time. It's only about an hour and I definitely don't want to cut into any of Joe's time here. But the I wanted to cover a little bit about our setup and timeline. So how this works is I ended up coming in a little bit after it was set up, but before we were actually operational. So there are some things not being very familiar with land banks in the beginning, um, approaching it from you know more of the public side of things. There are some things that I wished I had known, and there are some things that I'm really, really proud of, of what we've done so far. So I just wanted to cover some of those things so that if, if you were new to it, you had some idea of, hey, here's what to look out for, or here's what really worked well for somebody else. So one of the topics was the land bank setup and timeline. Um, the next topic that I'll cover after that is getting the municipalities and school districts on board. We've got a lot of them that we needed to needed to get in touch with and I'll go over that what worked well and what didn't and then the biggest question that I was encountering even when I was going to conferences um, all over the country last two years ago whenever in 2019 when when it was still happening um, was people who were unfamiliar with the pro unfamiliar with land banks were constantly saying we need to figure out how to get control over the properties, whether they were in Pennsylvania or they were in Nevada. Um, it was the same question, like how do we get control over these properties? So those are the three topics that I'm going to touch on today. Okay, what did your setup and timeline look like? So my thing that I've been telling everybody lately when they say, you know, how long will this take? My stock re -answer, stock answer is now we aren't fast but we are good eventually. Like we will make, so there's still a lot of things that we're very new at. Um, I'm very upfront and honest about, hey, this is our first time doing it. We may decide to do it a completely different way or second time of doing it, but we're going to make sure that this is done right and it's done very well. We just aren't sure how much time it's going to take. So if you look at this basic timeline and those three green, those three green circles are the, the topics that I'm covering today, but 
our land bank was established in December of 2017, at the very end of December of 2017. That's when the legislation went through locally. Um, we had a nine member board ap appointed. So we've got a nine member board. Um, they had their first meeting in April of 2018 and then public outreach and education began. In February of 2019 is when I came on board. Um, then we really ramped up, we ramped up the public outreach, we ramped up meeting with the municipalities and in June of 2019, our first member joined. Um, they actually, they actually signed an old copy of our ICA, our Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement. They signed, they were so eager to join, they signed an old copy and then re-signed the new copy once we had everything finalized. So they were pretty enthusiastic. We kept up with the public outreach. Um, and then in November of 2019, our first properties were acquired. That December, we used our priority bid at the judicial sale for the first time. And I can't remember how many properties that we ended up with. I wanna say it was six or seven. Um, and then we did our first demolition in June of, of last year. So that kind of gives you an idea what, what I realized after talking with all of these other land banks after, after being in touch with um, several of them and paying attention is that's not atypical. It typically is taking a lot of land banks about a year and a half to two years to, to actually begin to go from the setup to actually get to a point where they're able to take on properties and actually begin operations. So I thought that was handy to know just in case you were starting in the very beginning or as I usually tend to think, am, you know, are we are we being really slow with this? Are, is this taking longer than it should? No, it's probably about where it should be. So um, the things that we did really, really right is because this was so new to me and, and I am a sucker for learning new things, I immediately set up visits with several other established land banks that were around you know, within a two hour drive of me. And I actually went and visited them in person. And that was hugely helpful because you were able to pick up on, again, this will, this may need to be a virtual visit for you, but, um, or, you know, once, once the pandemic has lightened up a little bit, you might be able to go out and visit again. Um, but it was hugely helpful as far as being able to see not only the properties that they were taking on, we got a tour of several properties, it really uh, it was enlightening as far as how much hoarding happens and, and how much damage is in certain properties and how, how actually not damaged some properties are. Um, they were also able to share with us a lot of their documentation, a lot of their operations and their checklists for things. And it was just really, really helpful to see how other places do it. Um, also, from the beginning, we were looking at long-term scalability. I mean, we only took on six or seven properties in the beginning. Um, I think we're up to 12 or 13 or 14 right now. It depends. Um, but knowing the size of other land banks that they were taking on hundreds or sometimes thousands of properties over a decade or more, um, that is, we, we knew we wanted to set it up right from the beginning or as right as we could. We can always change things later, but we wanted to set it up as right as we could from the beginning. So we were looking at scalability. We got QuickBooks into place. We got a website into, into place. We started using eProperty Plus right from the beginning. Um, and we, we really set that up long-term scale. Also, we're in a unique position where we actually have quite a bit of funding that's built in. We're getting about a million dollars in gaming funds per year we are fiercely defending that money as far as making sure that it is, it is being spent appropriately, making sure that it is, um, uh, there are a lot of people who have a lot of ideas of how it should be spent. So we wanted to make sure that we were staying on task. Uh, again, possible changes that I would make is I would stop guessing with the time estimates because everything's taking way longer than we think it, that it should. So, uh, at this point, I just keep saying, by the end of 2021, we think this demo, you know, I feel safe saying that by the end of 2021, could be March, could be May, we don't know, but it'll happen. And then um, we actually were approached several times about applying for different grants and we weren't in a position where we were able to. And then the county hired a grant writer and I would say, if you've got the opportunity to work, if you whether you've got the funding or you don't have the funding, 
and you're looking for it, work with a grant writer early and often if you can in order to try to secure some of that funding, any funding that you can. Um, because when you don't have to worry about where the money is coming from, or if you know that you have a certain pocket of money that you can work with, it, it really helps be able to make some, some really great decisions that way. All right, how did we convince members to join? Um, so low pressure transparency plus a dose of storytelling. What does that mean? So if you look at this map right here, this map, the gray, let's start with the gray area right in the center of the top there. That is the city of Erie. That is, um, that is the territory covered by the Erie Land Bank. They had, you know, the Erie, they have one school district, they have one municipality, and then of course the um, county executive and the tax claim bureau needed to sign off. So they had five signatures that they needed to get in order to operate. If you look at the rest of it, we've got 37 municipalities that we cover, 12 different school districts that we cover. Um, when I added it all up in the, in the beginning when it was looking a little bit overwhelming, when I added it all up, I realized that we had 52 different signatures when you counted county executive, tax claim bureau, and then the land bank itself signing. We had 52 different signatures that we needed to keep track of. And the city land bank had five. So they had a deck of cards and we, or I'm sorry, they had a poker hand and we had a deck of cards. So now that's not, uh, that's not anything against them because they're fabulous and they have entirely different issues that they needed to deal with. But the scale of who we needed to be in contact with and what we needed to keep track of was big. Um, so what we started doing is right away, started getting face-to-face Again, face to face, I don't care if it's Zoom to Zoom, but started having real conversations with the local municipalities and the local school districts. And I'd take whatever I could get. If they wanted me to show up to a meeting, I'd show up to a meeting. If they wanted to have a one on one conversation about it or start smaller and just show up and talk to one person in the municipality, whatever they would give me, I would take and I'd get face to face with them. Um, also, it was very, low, it was very low pressure as far as one of the places that I showed up to, they said, so you want us to sign up for the land bank? And before I could stop myself, before I could stop myself, I was like, well, I don't care if you sign up for the land bank or not. It's not like I get a bonus if you sign up, but I do want you to know about it. I want you to know that this is an option for you and then you make your own decision and go from there. So um, it's very, it's, it was just very much like, I want you to be aware. I want you to be educated because I come from a really big family. I can't see offering one member and not telling another member about it. So anything here that you see, you can see who's been signed up for so far. This is a current map. Um, the areas that are not signed up are not because they're not interested. It's just because we haven't had a chance to talk with them yet, or we haven't had a chance to get in front of, get in front of them yet. Um, let me just double check here. Uh, oh, so the other thing that I did is that I made sure that we told stories about local stories that made this real because there were a lot of questions, especially when you're in a rural area, it was, it was a lot of why should I care if this property is blighted, if the other houses around it are fine? I mean, won't somebody do something with it eventually? And in most of these cases, no, these ones had been a long time coming. So this one on Cherry Street, um, what I ended up telling, I ended up telling this story just about everywhere that I went, where this property, it's not this property that the story is about, it's about another one on the block. And another house on the block, the owners had purchased the property. They had, they purchased it within the last decade or so. Um, invested quite a bit of money into redoing it, rehabbing it, um, and, and really sinking a lot of money into it. And then they went to refinance it. When they went to refinance it, the, um, the bank came back and said, oh, I'm sorry, this appraised lower than what you bought it for, you know, almost 10 years ago. And they said, how in the world, you know, we bought it, it's thing, the, the neighborhood has been appreciating. We bought it 
we put money into it. How is it possibly lower? And they said, when they pulled up the appraisal, they said, because you have a blighted property directly across the street from you and it is sinking the value of your home that much. So that person ended up, luckily the timing of it was really well, was really good because uh, they ended up going to both the municipality and the school district right around the same time that I was talking with them. And suddenly signing up with the land bank became a very, very, very big priority for them. So I'm, I think there's a lot of value in telling stories that are local that are real and showing how it is affecting the the uh, the members of the community. All right, so what we did right, we did a lot of face to face, we told real stories about real people, everything was very no or low pressure. Um, oh, the other thing is we stayed really consistent with our ICAs. There are some municipalities who were like, well, we want this change, well, we want that change. We have 38, you know, 37 municipalities and 12 school districts that we're dealing with. I'm not going to remember who has what line in their ICA and what needs to, it's going to be consistent. We're going to keep it the same. The other big thing is we stayed out of the municipal and the school relations. Sometimes they were like, well, we want the, the school district wants the municipality run it by them first. Great. You need to work it out with them. You need to have a side agreement or you need to have an additional rider or whatever it may be. You need to have that with them. We don't need to be in the middle of it. We just need to know that you're okay with us operating here. And the other thing that we did really, really right is we realized really early on we needed one point of contact for each community. Um, some of our communities have a lot of active members and some of them know that, um, some of them have a lot of active members and some of them know that uh, you know, that we were, we were looking to be there. And it, it really, it became really important to have one point of contact and one really, um, yeah, one point of contact per community. Um, and then the other thing that we do is some of the school districts had to sign a bunch of times. Some of them had up to six different municipalities. I would have separated out and just had a, had a school district ICA and had them sign once and make it easy for them. All right, how do we get control over the properties? Uh, the So superpowers, emergency exits, and a lot of patients. Basically what it is, is we don't have any teeth as a land bank, but what we can be is we can be the good guy or we can be the emergency exit if somebody needs to, um, if, somebody, if somebody has a property that has now become a burden for them and they don't know what to do with it anymore. So this property right here, I've realized that we had to get really, familiar with code enforcement and what has and hasn't been done. This property right here is very obviously a blighted property. I mean, it's missing a roof and two walls. I found out very recently that it hasn't even been condemned yet because the local communities were trying to work with the owners, all very admirable, but they wanted to know when the land bank could step in and take it over. And I said, the thing is you need to do your part you absolutely need to do code enforcement. You need to you need to send them out. You need to get it condemned. You need to you need to start your process, and then we can be an option for them, kind of an out, an emergency exit for them, um, where they could donate their property to the land bank if they needed to. This property was our first donation. Uh, a tree fell on the house. Insurance totaled it. Luckily, the owner was talking with uh, the municipal official that is our point of contact, and he said, I'm just going to quit paying the taxes on it and let the county take it back at the tax sale. She said, why don't you talk to Christy at the land bank and see if they'll take it as a donation? We did, and it was our very first demolition last year, so that worked out really, really well. And uh, okay, so what we did really well is we kept it. It's like we're the good we're the good guy. We are we don't have any teeth, but we are an option for you if you need us. Um, so we encourage the donations. We've gotten some great donations that way. We kept it voluntary with the municipalities as far as um, there was no minimum or maximum number of properties that they could ask us to acquire. So we made sure that each of the municipalities knew what other municipalities were doing so that they knew what the options were. It kind of kept those, uh, kept planting that seed of the possibilities, kind of kept it top of mind. 
And then we use a process of, instead of a process of selection, we use process of elimination. So everything's a possibility until it's not. That's with judicial sales, it's with property dispositions, as far as the end use goes, everything's a possibility until it's not. So we might have a favorite, but at least we're keeping all of our options open. And then possible changes, and this is more, these are really little things, but I'd make sure to call the utility companies way earlier than you think that you need to, because we've had a couple that got missed during storms and then it delayed some demolitions. Um, we've got demolition funds that I wish we had really tacked into earlier. And then uh, tracking contact info for interested parties. Right away, people start calling and are very interested in it. And sometimes it seems so far away and we, we have gotten much better about tracking that earlier. And then also, sometimes it seems like a good idea to bring in our municipal officials to answer questions about a property. I wish that we had done that a little bit less. I mean, the board sometimes needs to discuss some things and, and go from there. So um, that is it. That's what I summed up. I hope we made it in time. And now I'm gonna turn it, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop sharing and I believe we're gonna turn it over to Joe. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, so a little bit about me. My name is Joe Chalk. I am the executive director of the Northeast Pennsylvania Land Bank Authority. Um, that's kind of my uh, after hours job, I guess you would say. My main job is I am the executive director of the City of Pittston's Office of Community Development and the Redevelopment Authority of the City of Pittston. Um, a little bit more background about me. Before I joined the city of Pittston back in 2012, I served with uh, as a government services manager for the Northeast Pennsylvania Alliance, which is a local development district assisting counties or municipalities in the seven county region on everything from Act 47 to grant writing. Uh, and also I served on the other side of the table. Uh, as you say, I was an elected official in, a, in the borough of 44 for 12 years where I served as its council president for 10. Uh, and I earned my degree in political science from Penn State. So let me get into the story of the Northeast Pennsylvania Land Bank. So how it started. So back in 2012, the city was well into its downtown revitalization and we wanted to take a greater look um, at a more comprehensive approach to a citywide revitalization. So we developed a quasi, what we call a quasi white paper that identified eight um, prongs of a plan to address the city's revitalization. And the second prong uh, was what we call the neighborhood housing initiative. The city faced a multi, multi generational issue of not addressing um, residential properties uh, and we had a lot of issues that needed to be addressed. So we needed to develop a comprehensive plan. Just, I'll throw some statistics at you. Um, in 2012, when this paper was written, um, we identified that 63% of our housing stock was built before 1939, uh, and 80% was built before 1959. We had an 11% residential uh, vacancy rate, and we had a 47, 43 owner rental uh, split. Um, so we developed this plan, we presented it at a public meeting uh, where we invited municipal officials from the greater Pittston region, county officials, state officials, school districts, uh, bankers, contractors, and, and county judges. Uh, from there, uh, at the same time and, and right after that, the Land Bank Act passed and the city of Pittston had identified the land bank as another tool to help us uh, address the blight issue in the neighborhoods. Within that land bank law, uh, at the time of its adoption, it required 10,000 residents to form your own land bank. The city of Pittston has about 8,000 residents. So we were required to identify some partners. Um, so we reached out to the Housing Alliance for some assistance and guidance on how to go about uh, doing this. So. 
in September of 2013, uh, the, the Housing Alliance came up here. We held a meeting with several um, neighboring municipalities. We invited uh, officials from the school district. Uh, and uh, we went over what land bank, we did, you know, we did this, we did a land banking one-on-one -on -one with them. And uh, immediately we had two municipalities um, sign on to, to join the land bank with us. We were just looking for one and we got two that night. Uh, within several days, we were up to 10 people, 10 municipalities that were interested in joining, uh, joining us. Uh, we ended up with only five, but it was a exciting time there. So the first step in our process was forming these municipal agreements. Uh, the first page of our, our municipal agreements there. Uh, each municipality adopted this by ordinance. Uh, it, the, it adopted the, the land bank's policy. That was the simplest step in this whole entire process. Uh, our next step was going out to the, the school districts to enter into agreements with them. Um, some of the things that I wanna point out to, to help you as you go out and do this is that uh, school district officials, uh, board members, they don't deal with blight, they deal with curriculum. So they don't really understand uh, the impacts that it has on municipalities. So we had to educate the board members um, what blight does, the impacts it has, um, not just economically, but we had to tell them the story of what kind of impacts it would have on the educational system. Um, then the other, the other thing is you have to talk to the business managers and superintendents who are more focused on the financial implications of the idea of revenue sharing, um, which brings me to my next point, which we dealt more readily with in the county approach was um, post revenue. So the county in particular in the school districts to a lesser extent, when they, they look at their tax assessments, they see a property at 123 Main Street and they see it's assessed at $100,000 and that means you know, that means $2,000 in tax revenue to them. The problem is, is for three, five, six, seven years, that tax revenue has not been paid. So when you're discussing it with them, they, they, they think they're losing revenue and when in the event they're not getting any revenue now, so they're not losing anything. So you have to explain that whole ghost revenue uh, idea to them. Um, some of the other issues we faced at the county were the misconceptions of what the land bank was. The term bank itself caused great consternation among the elected officials and the public. They thought we were creating another financial institution um, that was going to make money off of uh, properties. So we had to explain uh, you know, the basics of what a land bank was. Um, we also had to address you know, false narratives of the mission of a land bank. We had some of uh, public officials and we had some uh, members of the public who um, said that we were going to go after the best properties in the county and we were going to make enormous profits. When everybody that does this knows that that is not what we are doing. We are going after properties that we, I affectionately refer to as a dog's breakfast. Um, they are the worst of the worst properties. Um, some of the other things, Luzerne County had some political scandals, the Kids for Cash, if anybody's not familiar. So that was right before we, we went out on this uh, adventure. So we had to address the public's distrust of another governmental entity. Um, and then we had to, the biggest struggle that we had after we got through all that process was our ability to exercise a Trump bid as a non-county land bank. Um, and to make matters worse is we had to deal with a third party that the county had engaged to administer their tax sales. Um, so I'll get into that a little bit later. So the, the land bank formed um, late 2013, early 2014. We were the fourth land bank in the state and we were the first multi-municipal one. Uh, each uh, municipality appointed one voting representative and then those board members appointed one at-large citizen member. We adopted some bylaws which identified our policies and procedures for operations of meetings and um, my role and, and abilities to function. Uh, the articles of incorporation were filed with the state and the land bank is staffed by the redevelopment authority of the city of Pittston, which it was uh, part of the policy that was adopted by ordinances. 
The next step we took was the adoption of policies and procedures that guide us on how we do our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, the first of which was our acquisition and disposition policy, uh, where we identified priorities of what types of properties we would acquire, and then how would we go about uh, returning them to the tax rolls. It also established uh, how we could uh, transact business to the extent that I could do it without board approval and times when the board would need to step in. We then we also developed a pre-qualification application where developers and or individuals that were interested in acquiring these properties from us um, could pre-qualify. Uh, so they would submit an application, they provide us all their information. Uh, we would check on to make sure that they don't have any code deficient properties in our jurisdiction. We check on to see if they have any tax delinquencies. We check to see if they have any sewer or water liens. Um, if they meet all that, uh, then they become eligible. And then when we have uh, properties, they're notified of that they can go ahead and acquire any of these properties that we have, they're, they're qualified. And when we were forming th these policies, um, we affectionately borrowed from, you know, several other municipalities or entities that were doing this. Uh, Westmoreland County um, had some very good ones that we used. And then across the nation, we found a couple others. So our first property that we acquired was a donation from the uh, remnants of a Lehman Brothers Mortgage Company. Uh, it was located, it's right there on your screen. It was there in West Pittston Borough. Uh, it had sit, sat vacant for five years, I believe, before we acquired it. And this was the condition we, this is the day we acquired it. Um, the next time, the next acquisitions were the repository. We acquired properties from the repository. Mm -hmm. In 2016, we acquired 10 properties uh, in three different municipalities. Behind the shrubbery there is a house that's here in the city of Pittston. The next one was uh, judicial cell acquisitions. And as I said earlier, we could not use our Trump bid um, because of the uh, miscommunications, I guess, is the, the most polite way I can say it. Despite several meetings with both the county and the third party entity about the, our powers and their requirements to publish our powers, uh, they continue to fail to do so uh, to allow us to use our, our Trump or priority bid. So we went to the tax sale in October 2016. We competitively bid for multiple properties. Um, and we acquired uh, several on that day. A lot, we paid a lot more money than we should have. The first time we got to use our Trump, Trump bid was uh, just two years ago. Uh, and we acquired 11 properties across four municipalities. The property on the screen there is a, uh, a house in Avoca Borough that has been vacant and uh, ransacked for several years. So then we went out and our next mission was to demolish some of these properties that have been standing. So this property on your screen here is at 525 New Street in Duryea. Uh, we were able to take it down because we were successful as Christy said, uh, to a lesser extent with some uh, LSA, the, the gaming funds money. We got a small grant to do some acquisition and to start up our land bank. And uh, this was the first one. The neighbors across the street, when we tore this down, were crying and gave some great remarks to the newspapers. They had to live with that for 20 years. This is what it looks like to post demolition. The next one here is 117, 121 Pine Street in the city of Pittston. This property looked like this since 19, the late 1970s. Um, the city had numerous citations and hearings and fines. We had hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines against the, the owner who just ignored them, um, did not address the property. It sat like that since the 19, late 1970s. And we were able to take that down also with some LSA funds. There's a property in 425 Liberty Street, West Pittston. Uh, and it's just another example of a demolition. Here's a property. This is um, kind of a signature project for the land bank. Uh, we partnered with uh, the Redevelopment Authority um, in the city of Pittston here. And here's two properties that we had that were uh, located on Main Street um, that we acquired. And uh, here's some uh, in progress photos of the demolition and post demolition. And this is what it looks like uh, today. Uh, we took 
nine parcels there and converted it into a multi-million dollar project uh, where a new Dollar General and a uh, Luzerne Bank are located now. Uh, all those properties were blighted. Uh, we partnered with the, as I said, regional authority and a private developer to acquire all nine parcels. And we took properties that were valued together assessed at um, about $200,000 to it's assessed at almost $1.2 million today. So returning the properties to the tax rolls. Uh, the first property that we returned to the tax rolls was um, in the West Pittston property. Uh, it was sold to the neighbor as a side yard uh, and it has been, it's now it's in its third year of being back in the tax rolls. To date, we've returned 10 properties uh, and we have four more properties that will be sold over the next two or three months. We've returned uh, almost $1.35 million in tax assessments uh, and the four properties that are pending will add another $250,000 back to the tax rolls. And in 2020, our tax sharing uh, generated $3,333 for the land bank to further its operations. And that is the end of my presentation. So at this time, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. Thanks, Joe. And thank you, Christy, for sharing your stories with us. As I was hearing from both of you, I was thinking to myself, wow, the, uh, the approach that you both took, there's similarities, but there's also differences. And thinking about having um, Christy, having that million dollar budget from the start and able to invest in certain processes that other land banks don't necessarily have. But also, even given that, your need to go personally and do the outreach to local governments and school districts. Joe, I know we've talked previously about um, that process and how um, it, it takes time. And Christy, underscoring what you said, <clears throat> things that you think may take a couple months to accomplish, when you look at all the parties that are involved and have a say in land bank operations, <clears throat> you see that it's gonna take longer than you originally expected. So building that extra time into whatever part of your program you're working on is critical. Um, we've had a couple questions from the audience and I'm gonna <clears throat> toss um, these questions out to both of you and ask you to respond. The first one is, uh, does a member mean a school district or taxing body that is willing to work with you? Christy, do you wanna start with that? Yeah, I think that came across when I was, when I was talking about our members. Um, that's, that's the word that I just used for kind of lumping them both in together. So yeah, that's any municipality, any school district that has signed an ICA or is, was possibly interested in signing an ICA with us. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. And then <clears throat> I think you answered this in your discussion, uh, Christy, but I'll throw it out to Joe. Are the land bank agreements the same with all school districts? Yeah, and I think Christy hit that nail on the head is if you if you try to start doing these uh, nuanced agreements with each municipality or municipality or school district or even the county, you're never going to be able to keep track of that, especially with, you know, especially for my entity where it's myself and a, an administrative assistant. So you can't, you can't do that. You'll never be able to comply with all the agreements that way. And here are a couple other questions. Um, when you talk about um, impact, um, would you share a little bit, each of you, on the impact that your um, land bank is making on the community uh, on a broader scale? I know you shared your stories about individual properties, but would you just weigh in a little bit more on your impact? Well, I'll, I'll take this one first if Chrissy's okay with that. Okay. So I threw, in my presentation, I threw out some statistics. So some, you know, we're doing other things than the land bank, but some of the measurable statistics that I have is that as I said, in 2012, we had 63% of our housing stock was built pre-1939. And because of some of our efforts, that number is now down to 54%. 80% um, was built pre-1959. Now we're down to 74%. So we're making headway uh, and getting rid of some of that older housing stock and uh, getting new stuff developed. 
So that's some of it. Some of it is is anecdotal, right? So I mentioned in my Durier story, the, the homeowners across the street, when we knocked that house down, they literally were crying on the street and, uh, and doing interviews with the local media crying. Uh, they were so ecstatic. The same thing with the people in Pine Street who were living next to that property for almost 50 years uh, in the condition it was. And they were just so enthusiastic to see it finally, something finally happening. Christy? Yeah, I would say we don't have we don't have specific numbers or stats that we can share necessarily yet, but we do have the stories. Um, and I was just on the phone yesterday from with a person who is going to be purchasing one of our properties as a side lot. And initially, a, uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago, really, um, we had purchased we had we had used our priority bid at the judicial sale and we had acquired this property. And I got a phone call saying, "Hey." I was going to purchase that property and this has been such a headache for me for such a long time. I mean, for, for the last, you know, eight or 10 years, he has had blue tarp pieces, every storm fall, flying off the house next door and going into his yard. I mean, he's just cleaning up stuff from this all the time. And so I told him, I said, here's the deal. I know you were going to purchase it. You were going to spend your money. You'd have to bid against other people. I said, cause it looks, it's, it's one of those houses that looks cute from the outside but it required everything from foundation all the way back. Once you got into it, it required everything to be redone from the foundation all the way through the roof. So it was definitely a demo. He wanted to buy it in order to demo it. I said, this is gonna benefit you because you're a neighboring property. We're gonna take it, we bought it. We don't wanna keep it. We're not in the game. Again, we're the worst real estate investors ever. We don't wanna keep a property. We are going to get rid of it one way or the other you're in a perfect position to get it once it's demoed. Let us spend the money to get it, let us demo it, and then you can purchase it. And so um, the building has now been taken down. The, they're gonna reseed it in the spring once the snow melts a little bit. And um, he's purchasing the property for, I believe it was $680 from us because it's $10 per linear foot of frontage. So it's a killer deal for him. He is beyond ecstatic. He's incredibly patient with us while we're getting it all done. And I, as I told him yesterday, I said, hey, you're done with the blue tarp. You're done with blue tarp in your yard. He's like, I am so happy. You can't even tell me how happy I, you can't even tell how happy I am. So I, to me, it's what are, what's the community impact? It's those one by one stories that we get that it just affects everybody. Thanks, Christy. So what I'm hearing from both of you is you're serving the communities that are part of the land bank to improve their quality of life, to prepare for reinvestment, and to try to help these communities build prosperity and growth locally by dealing with these problem properties that have sat um, untouched and uncared for, um, for sometimes decades at a time. Um, in, the, in the interim, a couple other questions have come in, and I'll start by answering this very basic question and then turn it over to you both. Um, where does the money come from to purchase the properties? What happens after the property is acquired? And where does the renovation money come from? And how are professionals and contractors engaged? I'll start by where does the money come from? Um, the land bank law authorizes um, land banks to finance their operations through a number of mechanisms, public and private loans and grants, uh, proceeds from sales, uh, bonds, which no land banks have uh, issued yet. Uh, there are uh, provisions in the law that allow for the land bank to share tax revenue. It's called the 550 tax recapture. So for five years after a land bank owns and then transfers a property, the tax collecting authorities, um, again, their partners, so they have to agree to this, agree to share up to 50% of the tax revenues from those properties for up to five years. Um, those uh, and then member contributions and general fund allocations. Some land banks are lucky where they get um, general funds from the local governments that just can or they participate by being a member and contributing a certain set amount. So those are the mechanisms that are authorized for finding funding. And then after the property is acquired, um, the goal is to clear the title if possible 
and then um, transfer the property to a new owner who will then uh, take care of the property. Uh, and that sometimes involves a redevelopment agreement where there are promises made as to how long it will take for them to, to take the steps to bring it up to code. And then I'll ask both of you to answer uh, way into on where the renovation money comes from and how are professionals and contractors engaged? Like how do you engage your demolition contractors or rehab contractors? So Joe, do you wanna start with that? Yeah, so we have not done any renovations yet. We have written a few grants uh, and we're fingers crossed. We're hopeful to hear in the next couple of weeks that we're successful on doing mm -hmm. some renovations. Uh, we have just strictly done acquisition selling back to the to neighboring property owners and demos. Um, so the demo money came from, the first demo money is I had briefly mentioned that we got a, uh, a small local share account uh, grant for a couple hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars. And we were able to take down five or six properties with that, with that funding. So we, you know, the process for selecting for the demolition for that was, you know, just like a municipality or any other governmental entity would do is you develop plans and specs and you publicly bid it and you publicly award it. Uh, hiring our solicitor engineer is the same process that a municipality would take as you would, uh, we, we did it, uh, an informal RFP process and uh, the benefit for the solicitor is that he got to do the work pro bono. Um, so we got, we had a lot of responses on that one. So we've had a lot of pro bono work. That's the other thing uh, to, to address the, where does the money come to start up is, is a lot of the money to start our land bank came from the city of Pittston, uh, paid for my time and staff to create this land bank. And then people like our solicitor did the work for free and has only been paid. You know, he only makes money really when we sell a property, makes a little bit on the transaction. So, um, you know, you have to find people that are interested in doing that. Christy? Yeah, I mean, we, we're in a little bit of a different situation where we did have, we do have money to start. Um, there's also demolition funds where $14.25 off of every real estate transfer in Erie County is put into a fund for demolition. So um, we use that along with the Erie Land Bank. We're, we're actually administering it, but, you know, we're using it between us. But um, once a property is acquired, and I, this is, this this answer will lead into that, that next, the answer for the next question is once a property is acquired, some of them we know are demolitions because they've already been condemned by the municipality. But there's some properties, especially when we're getting them at the judicial tax sale, we don't know which way it's gonna go. Is it gonna be a renovation or is it gonna be a demolition? We actually hire a contractor to go out and evaluate the property from top to bottom and um, put in, we've got estimated dollar figures for what everything's going to need. And um, it's a really thorough report that we, borrowed from borrowed and, and modified from another land bank. Um, that helps us decide whether or not it's going to go the renovation route or the demolition route. Then what we do is we haven't done any renovations ourselves yet either. I mean, you're right now you're looking at the CEO, CFO, COO, and janitor of the Erie County Land Bank. So put, putting on a tool belt is not going to be my next thing. And, and managing something like that is not something that we've got time for right now with everything else that we have going on. So the renovations that we do have are really just putting out for development. You know, we're putting them out for sale with development agreements that these things that were addressed in the, um, in the contractor's report, those are, all are in the application and those will all be put in the developer's agreement once it gets transferred. And there'll be a timeline for that. So we're not coming up with any money for that right now. Those are whoever purchases the property needs to know this is what you need to, uh, this is what you need to do to the property. And this is approximately how much it's going to cost in order to do that. Great. And then um, another question, which I think uh, you address partially during your presentations. What were some of the most effective stories, statistics, or arguments you used to illustrate the impact of blight to school districts? Was there any particular story that worked best? If you want me to, if you want me to start, I would say that one that I told about the Albion property, where it wasn't the neighbor, it, it, it was the neighbor of this property. It wasn't this property that was making a huge impact on the this property was making a huge impact on the neighborhood 
if you look at just the numbers, the biggest argument that I use with the school district is it's never just that property. It's never, you can say, oh, well, how much are we really losing from this one particular property? It's never just that property. It's a funnel effect. And the neighboring properties can lose, I've seen numbers where it says neighboring properties can easily lose 20% of their value. Um, the other big thing is we are due for another tax assessment. It seems to come through about every 10 years. We're due for another tax assessment. So if you've got a blighted property in an area and your, your tax revenue is you know yay high, but now there's this blighted property in this area, that can easily come down and that's going to affect your taxes as well uh, or your tax revenue as the school district. And then just the, like, like Joe was talking about, like blight affects so many different areas of, a, of the lives of the community members. It definitely plays a role in the education. Thanks. Um, there's a yeah. couple more questions. Oh, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, Christy, Christy kind of hit the nail on the head about there about the, you know, the, the impacts of the neighboring properties. But the other thing is that we kind of took the, um, our mayor, the city's mayor is a former school psychologist. So he talked, he gave me some information statistics about how, and, you know, the Housing Alliance is addressing this is with, you know, housing insecurity. If, if you're living in one of these blighted properties, uh, the, the odds of you being successful in school are extremely low. And then in these neighborhoods where there's a lot of blight, um, if, you t if you pull out, extrapolate their testing scores, their scores are, are not the same as the, those people in, in more uh, higher income neighborhoods. So we had, we presented the school boards those types of statistics as well. So Joe, that leads to um, our next question, which I'll ask you to start with about addressing systemic inequities in the enactment of housing policies and the alignment of goals as it relates to, for example, industrial decline, redlining, disinformation, distrust environment. Um, do you have any um, thoughts to share on how you address those or what you're um, doing now to try to address those inequities? I, I wish I had the time to be able to to really get into those in our job. So, you know, we're not really, I mean, honestly, we're not really don't even have the time to consider those types of things. We're, we're literally just trying to identify the worst properties and get them down. Uh, we're not thinking about the, other than, you know, some of the uh, surface issues, we're not really getting into that. We're not delving into that. I don't know if Christy is. Yeah, we're, not, we're not far enough along in the process where the good news is we haven't had to turn any properties down yet. It's all been what's been available and then what's going to be the best end use. And the, I know that the city of Erie has, they're much more, they're obviously in a city, they're urban. Um, the areas that I'm dealing with are much more rural and it comes down to, uh, we, we just haven't had an opportunity. We haven't had an opportunity to make that kind of impact or address those types of things yet. It's on the, it's on, you know, it's on our radar as far as making sure that, um, it's on our radar as far as being aware of, but it's not something that, you know, as of right now, it, we might not be able to get a property in an area yet. Right. So something to come. Um, one final question before we wrap up and it's how can someone buy a property from land bank? Do not profit developers or neighboring property owners get a priority? Do you want to start with that one, Christy? Do you offer any kind of priorities to purchasers? Um, so yeah, if the if the, the the neighbors get a priority, if it's if the lot is going to be a side lot, so, so if we know that it's not going to be redeveloped, and we know it's going to be a side lot, then the neighbors get a priority. Um, they also get a little bit of a, a set price break. Um, in order to in order to uh, address the um how do some how does somebody buy it there's applications on our website uh, with every property that's available we've got an application and it spells out what they need who can apply you know what ne what needs to happen and what the end use of the property is going to be that's great joe any, so, any priorities on your end yeah so if if same thing all of our properties are listed on our website the neeplandbank.com and anybody at any time can go on there and review those and our policies and our applications are all on there. So we're always, it's a rolling application. We take them whenever. And yeah, we, we established within our policy nine priorities 
of what, so we focus on the end use, not who's buying it. Although we do talk about the people who can or can't buy it, but we have nine priorities. So depending on what you want to do with the property, uh, if there's a, a competitive bid, uh, we would we take it based on the higher priority. And you know, our priority is owner occupied residential housing. Great. Well, thank you, Joe. And thank you, Christy, uh, for the time today. I appreciate and the audience appreciates and the Housing Alliance appreciates your efforts to share your stories with attendees today. Thank you so much. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.